uh, when I share the stage with Paola. I don't know why. Maybe it's her MoMA connection or because she's Italian or whatever. So uh, I went into uh, the drawer that holds some of my special stuff and looked around. And uh, suddenly I heard something talking to me. Uh, it was this bolo and buckle set. Um, and it quite, you know, they quite clearly said, pick me, choose me. Um, and so I did, and I'm wearing it tonight. Now, I think the bolo uh, and buckle uh, said pick me because it had a relevant story to tell. Um, you see, it was designed by a man named Charles Lolima, who's a Native American Hopi artist. Uh, and this particular uh, balo and buckle were done in the uh, late 60s, at the very beginning of his career. Now, Lolima was born into a very traditional Hopi culture uh, in a very rural part of uh, the reservation in Arizona. Uh, he himself was a traditional person. He was a traditional shaman who participated in the secret Kiva rituals of the Hopi religion. Uh, but as an artist, Lolima framed himself, he framed himself as an interpreter of innovation to the Native American world and an interpreter of Native American tradition to the modern world. He used traditional forms like the bolo and the buckle, um, but he added new inspirations such as, well, maybe Picasso, don't know, uh, and different materials. Um, using gold and pearl instead of traditional turquoise and silver, and, uh, and new shapes as well. Some of his bracelets are these gorgeous architectural shapes. Uh, you can see them at the Museum of Art and Design. Um, so Lola will move back and forth between both worlds, connecting, engaging, and always creating the new. Uh, he designed objects that talked to his own people and to people around the world. He framed himself as an interpreter in much the same way as our guest tonight frames herself as an interpreter. So Paola Antonelli, Senior Curator of Architecture and Design at MoMA, is an extraordinary curator of design. I remember her first exhibition, uh, and just listen to this title, Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design. You had me at Mutant Materials. Uh, and ever since. Um, then an exhibition on many things, uh, I mean many exhibitions, one on safe, design takes on risk. Design takes on risk. Fantastic, design takes on risk. Then design and the elastic mind. Fantastic. And now my next exhibition, which is called Talk to Me. So Paula, please talk to us. Oh, Thank you so much. No, I'm so really excited, you know, that's all there is. But, you know, your story about the bolo and the buckle is exactly what I'm talking about. And truly, you know, in design, we know that objects have always talked to us throughout the centuries. There's always been some kind of connection that we've had with objects. Maybe it was an emotional connection, affective. It's always been like that. That nothing is ever completely new, but technology renews it and makes it ours once again. And today, we've come to expect a little bit more of an explicit communication with objects. And many objects have interfaces, they react to how we behave, they know what they want us to do, they give us feedback. And designers today are not just in charge of giving objects form, function, meaning, you know, all the different definitions of design that have changed throughout the 20th century, but if they're really good, designers are also the ones that write the initial script on which the conversation will then be improvised. So this latest uh, foray into the world of contemporary design, you know, I take all of these exhibitions as a form of exploration, is really on this, design as script writing. You've heard so much about the need to have a narrative, the need to uh, have a storytelling experience. Yes, it's true. We need to do that today because it's just the beginning when you give an object to a person. And this whole exhibition will actually be 
focused on this particular theme. So it's called Talk to Me. You know, Bruce was kind enough as to highlight the fact that I love titles. And I always, if you noticed, Bruce, I also tend to always take movie titles and change them somewhat. So Safe was, of course, the Todd Haynes movie, right? Design of the Elastic Mind had the same awkward syntaxes of Sex in the City. You know, it's like I always thought that Sex in the City was so awkward, so Design of the Elastic Mind was something similar, and so on and so forth. Talk to me, of course, it's at the same time talk to her all over, and also it is talking to me, you know, like a taxi driver. So there's this kind of uh, way to immediately plug into people's minds with a title that hopefully will set the audience and uh, the visitors both in the exhibition space online and the visitors to the catalog, because I also think that one visits a catalog, hopefully they will be in the right frame of mind to actually uh, find themselves and find their own human experience in this exhibition. We started this exhibition about one year and a half ago. I say we because I'm working with Kate Carmody, who is the curatorial assistant on this show, and she's truly a co-author. And when we started thinking about the exhibition, we decided that we needed something to keep us on our toes. So immediately we decided to have a blog. I'm going to turn the lights down a little bit. I don't know how to do it. Yay. Is that good enough so you don't fall asleep? <laughs> One more? Okay, good. So um, we decided early on to want to have something to keep ourselves on our toes. But also, because people always ask us, how do you curate shows, we decided to make the process really transparent. This exhibition is about communication, we decided to start right away. So this blog um, has been on, and actually the last post was in November, because you know what happens when you have a blog that's a curse, because then you don't post, and you, but I've been tweeting. But you see there's a countdown um, to the exhibition, which now is much smaller, because the exhibition is in July. But we posted everything that was submitted to us, every suggestion that we got. People would be able to see a queue, and then they would be able to see what we were reading, what we were um, listening to. Everybody who suggested was listed in the, in the blog with links to his or her website. So it was a very transparent process that we decided to have for the exhibition. And the Tamagotchi kind of behave, be, became our natural mascot. I mean, I remember when the Tamagotchi was introduced, I was pretty young, but I remember how disturbing it was, because all of a sudden, you felt this terrible responsibility that was also accompanied by guilt and, uh, uh, and frustration and anguish for this little electronic pet, pet that was needy and really annoying sometimes. <laughs> so we decided that it was the best way to really express what technology and communication with objects is about today. And we decided to organize the exhibition. Well, at first we organized it through categories of objects, interfaces, interaction, etc. But then instead, we decided to revert to it, the idea of scale. Because it's not only things that talk to us, it's also our family, our homes, cities, governments, the whole world. So we decided to expand and organize it by objects. And the first object that also became a kind of a mascot for the exhibition is this great uh, twin bot by Casey Kinzer. Casey Kinzer is a graduate of the ITP at NYU, you know, the <coughs> Interactive Telecommunication Program. And twin bots, you know, this one that you're looking at is Sam, he's the one that's been out on most missions, are little cardboard robots with a little engine and wheels that have a flag that says, please help me cross Washington Square. And what Casey did is with a hidden camera, she followed how people were behaving with this robot. And it's truly a testimony to the fact that New Yorkers cannot resist giving directions to anything that seems in need to, you know, especially <laughs> small and powerful life. So she has all these movies of people helping Sam and then saying, no, no, you can't go that way. There's the street. It's dangerous. And turning him around. I mean, it's really hilarious to see how anything can spark a conversation going. We want to have Sam go through the atrium of MoMA on, when, on Friday afternoons after 4 and see how <laughs> <laughs> he's very insured. We'll see. Um, another beautiful set of objects comes from the Royal College of Arts in London. You know that, well, I don't know if you've seen my exhibitions. It's, they, they tend to be RCA shows. I really love, especially with the design interactions program there, with the critical design program. This work by uh, James Chambers is called the Attenborough Design Group. It's after Sir Richard Attenborough, who, as you know, has studied animal behavior for many, many years. And these are objects that 
behave like animals when in danger. So there's the CPU of a computer that lifts itself on the, on the legs when you spill coffee by mistake, where there's this old radio that has nostril and sneezes to free itself of dust when necessary. So even these just very small objects that, uh, uh, that show some routine behaviors, and then there are others that instead show, oh, I didn't ask you, do you think I can go to the movies without creating too much of a problem? Let's see if it works. Yeah, it works. This is worth seeing. I normally wouldn't do that and make you wait, but it's really worth seeing. I wonder if I have audio. Yes, I do. Perfect. No, no, that's quite all right, dear. Your father and I were just discussing his day at work. Why don't you tell our daughter about it, honey? Janie, today I quit my job. <laughs> and then I told my boss to go fuck himself, and then I blackmailed him for almost $60,000. Ask his parents. <laughs> your father seems to think this kind of behavior is something to be proud of. And your mother seems to prefer that I go through life like a fucking prisoner while she keeps my dick in a mason jar under the sink. How dare you speak to me that way in front of her? And I marvel that you can be so contemptuous of me on the same day that you lose your job. I didn't lose it. It's not like, whoops, where'd my job go? I quit. Someone has the asparagus. Oh, 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 oh. And I want to thank you for putting me under the added pressure of being the sole breadwinner now. I already have a job. No, no, don't give a second thought as to who's going to pay the mortgage. Well, just leave it all up to Carolyn. You mean you're going to take care of everything now, Carolyn? You mean everything? You don't mind having the sole responsibility? Your husband feels like you just quit his job and you don't come back. Someone, and please ask me the fuck out of the I'm not going to be a part of this. Shut up! <laughs> I don't know if you all recognize this is the great dialogue from American Beauty uh, in the scene that is almost next to the climax. So it's really great to see that objects not only talk to us, but also feel the brunt of familial tensions, you know, and they really vibrate with all this back and forth of the quarrel between husband and wife. And uh, Jeffrey Mann, who's really an interesting designer, did the stop motion movies by also making objects that actually will vibrate as they are filmed. So it's interesting to see how this idea, once you have an idea like talk to me, then you can find so much in the world um, of design, like this great Wi-Fi dowsing rod. It's like an old dowsing rod that lights up when there's Wi-Fi around it. <laughs> and then, of course, Talking Carl. I mean, I'm sorry, I just completely fell for Talking Carl. And we're talking to Yanko Roller, the designer, and he's recoding it, so we'll have a really huge Talking Carl on a big touch screen. And I hope that kids really will go and tickle and play with it. So, a really a celebration of all these different electronic pets that are part of our lives. And here I'm showing you a small selection of objects, of course, because I can't keep you here for hours. But there's going to be much more of these different pets that, have po that are populating our lives. And they have been populating our lives for a while. If you think about it, I mean, most of you have, um, were born with the Macintosh or Reading system. But before the Macintosh, you, there was not really too much of an electronic pet at home. It was the first, the 128K in 1984, it was the first time that one could have this live being with the little computer face and the little bomb when things were not going well, uh, sitting on the desk. So it was a, a new landscape in the home that we've grown accustomed to. I'm talking to you instead about the body and the mind. It's about bodies and minds that are able to communicate with each other and with the outside world in ways that previously were not even thinkable or possible, and it's technology that helped them to do so. And some of the expressions are quite whimsical, even though they come from, from kind of serious issues. Jonas Lowe looked at the statistics whereby at France Telecom, you know, the telecommunications company, uh, between, in about six months, in 2008, 32 people committed suicide. And he started wondering, is it a problem of being too compressed, of not being able to show your feeling, not being able to ask for help, not being able to let people know how you really are doing? And so he created this apparatus that basically you know, sends smoke signals of different colors to show people how you're feeling. Now, this is critical design, and you're all familiar with it, I think, because you are um, doing your studies here. Critical design is, is, of course, always exaggerated. It's always a little expressionistic. It's designers that build scenarios that are driven by objects to really push our thinking towards some extreme possible consequences of technology 
or some of the uh, consequences of the malaise of living today. Now, I'm much more positive or optimistic about technology. I do not believe that technology is making us dumber. I do not believe that we're not able to talk or write anymore. I actually think the opposite. But still, I very much appreciate these dystopian um, examples and these dystopian scenarios that enable us to think, what if it went the other way? There are also some quite benign ways to exaggerate a feeling of communication like this augmented ear that is at the same time um, a, a, a jewel and a way to show people your interest for the pavilion, the auricular pavilion. And also, <clears throat> there are other experiments. You know, the internet seems to be the uh, eternally uh, equalizing uh, medium of communication. And so some people have decided to transport the kind of equalizing format also in real life. And uh, Adi Maron has designed Short Plus Plus that are these like platforms that can be commanded and controlled by an application in your iPhone that enable you to both have a conversation with somebody really tall at level or even to reach high up in the aisle at the supermarket if you need to. So it really is interesting <coughs> to see how people are looking at things differently. But there are also very, very interesting experiments. I wonder how many of you are already familiar with the iWriter. Uh, how many of you have already heard about it? See, I'm so happy. The iWriter is really a great, great, great project. It's a series of programmers and artists. Many of them come from Ivy here in New York, and there's that Lieberman, James Fowlerly, and Roth. They were part also, they are part of Graffiti Research Lab. So, for a long time, they have been studying how technology can enable us to uh, continue our bad habits of guerrilla interventions in the city uh, without too many consequences. So laser tag was a way to tag buildings by laser and then erase the laser the tag shortly thereafter. But this time, they have applied their expertise to helping a great graffiti artist from LA, Tempt One, who, ha who, who has Lou Gehrig disease, ALS, so he's completely paralyzed except the eyes, they enabled him to write and to tag buildings remotely from his hospital bed with his eyes. It's an apparatus that of course has a camera and eye movement recognition and then a remote connection to a laptop that is on location and that can then use the laser tag technique technology in order to tag buildings. But you see, this to me is an example, a high-tech example of a concept that is a little bit rusty that's called extended usership. You might have heard it from some functionalist designers even a, a few years ago. Extended usership is the idea that sometimes we design for people with disabilities of various kinds, but the outcome is so good that can be then used by everybody for a better performance and a better life. The classical example of are the OXO good grips. You know, Sam Farber, the inventor of OXO, the founder of OXO, designed the first good grip for his wife, who had a wrist impairment. And then, seeing how comfortable good grips were, he decided to make a whole company and a whole empire uh, on them. You know, and that, of course, was uh, good grips could happen because of the new technology of, uh, uh, of elastomers, of, uh, el of rubbery elastomers. So it was a new way to mold rubber using granules as if it were plastic. So he could really find this kind of detailing that wasn't possible before. But the first impetus for his design was a disability. And so this whole idea of looking at disabilities as opportunities to actually do better for mankind at large is an attitude that technology has pushed forward. Uh, quite a bit. I was talking just a few weeks ago with Amy Mullins. Amy Mullins, you probably know her already, you've seen her dozens of times. She's that uh, gorgeous woman who happens to be a double amputee and uh, who has been in all of the Matthew Barney's videos, Prim Master, etc. And you know, there's the whole story of the double amputee that was not admitted to the Olympics because he was so much faster than so-called normal human beings. So, this whole idea of, uh, uh, of disability has been kind of turned over its head uh, by technology, by avatars, and by advancements in science. Of course, we're not going to uh, paint a rose horizon. Uh, Tent One is in his bed, and he's not doing well. But still, there is the idea that by applying technology to extreme situations, one can learn how to do better in the world at large, and that's important and worth really pushing. 
from the really serious to the whimsical but possible, there are many, many designers now that are working with scientists. In particular, there's a lot of back and forth going on with synthetic biology. Some of you might already know, but synthetic biology is a new branch of biology that studies the possibility of building brand new organisms from Lego-like bricks of DNA. So you can isolate certain types of DNAs and then combine them together to create organisms. And uh, Drew Andy is at Stanford University now, or maybe he's in Cambridge, he's going back and forth. These scientists change uh, Athenaeum so, so often and so fast that become the actors, the movie stars of today. But anyway, so Drew Andy is one of the most well-known scientific um, synthetic biologists. And Daisy Ginsburg and, uh, and James King, also from the RCA, worked with uh, a lot of uh, biologists. In particular, they participated in iGEM. iGEM is a jamboree, like a, 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 a competition that happens once a year in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it's students, both undergrads and grads from all over the world, coming together and uh, coming up with scenarios and competing about synthetic biology. Daisy and James uh, collaborated since the very start with the students from the Cambridge, England um, University and won first prize two years ago with E. chromi. E. chromi is a set of bacteria, engineered bacteria, that you drink like a milkshake and that react with the enzymes in your body um, that correspond to different diseases or different conditions and then color your stools. So your output is actually the diagnosis. There's a whole set of colors, you know, and that's uh, actually the, the whole presentation that will happen in the exhibition is this like briefcase, at the shape briefcase with samples of different, how can I say, turds of different colors and, and then a color chart that explains the different colors and different diagnoses. So the, the interesting part is that this is absolutely, absolutely serious and one could argue, sometimes I do argue with scientists, that designers might, might make them look less serious. You know, there was a, a conference at Columbia University last week and I moderated a panel where I was moderating um, a really great, you know, really visually talented and imaginative architect, you know, Francois Roche, and then I was moderating this great architectural theoretician, Sanford Quinter, and then I was moderating, I don't remember who the third was, but it was also somebody really, uh, oh, an artist, a visual artist, Fabian Marcato, and then the fourth was this great engineer from Reading University in the UK, who was probably making the most interesting presentation, the most imaginative, but he had the worst PowerPoint, you know, like the blue background, the yellow italic uh, fonts, and it's like scientists always have to look really, really bad in order to be taken seriously, so there's a, a, a little bit of a, 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 of a uh, passage here for new scientists or younger scientists to adopt design as a way to communicate their ideas. Um, social networks are very important, of course, to our lives today, but they tend to be kind of uh, design challenged. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but usually it's the worst interfaces. I mean, uh, when you do an exhibition like this, you're at MoMA, so you have to find good design examples. They have to be arresting, they have to be um, pushing, innovative, and you know, they have to be good. And I'm sorry, but I have not seen so far one social network that has a really well-designed interface. Maybe it's kind of a cliche or it's opposed to reject design, but I have had to insert social networks by looking at apps and games that are based on them and that are really beautiful. For instance, Tentacles is a game that lets you download an app and then play, you know, you're, you're like a squid-like form and you gather with other people and then you eat this little tentacle. So it's a game that is based on social networks even though it's not a social network itself. The third chapter in this exhibition is life. Life talks to us in many different ways. You know, it talks to us and we try to understand and make sense of it. And so, since it takes really a bird's eye view to take life in perspective, it's one of the fields where most visualization design happens. Of course, you know, visualization design is one of the um, fastest growing fields of design today. It's always existed. You know, once again, hieroglyphs, diagrams, they've always been around, but the computer really pushed it uh, to work much faster, and it's become almost like a mania. There are so many different sides that are about visualization from information is beautiful to visualizing.org. There are companies like GE that have really jumped on the wagon and, uh, and have from 
promoting visualization. Uh, and we see it every day. I mean, there's good visualization and there's bad visualization. But definitely, when it comes to life, many designers are approaching the matter this way. And this is one of the most well-known. It's Nicholas Felton, and it's F-E-L-T-O-N, who publishes every year the Feltron Report. And he called it Feltron because it sounds more corporate. But it's actually his own annual report. It's an annual report on his life. So he's been doing it for about six years, and this is, these are images of the 2009 ones. He tracks where he's eaten, with whom, how much he slept, where he's gone, how much sex he's had. So and everything gets then produced in diagrams and in a beautiful printed annual report, exactly the way a corporation would make it. Last year's report actually was different. He devoted it to his father because his father passed away in the fall of last year. So it's a very moving tribute that also really condenses uh, a very old ritual, that of mourning, with today's culture. So, quite interesting. But one of my favorite projects in the show is Jason Rohrer's Passage. Passage is a video game that lasts five minutes, and in those five minutes, you go through your own life. You're born, and you go through different obstacles, then you, if you're a guy, you get a little bald and a little gray, and then you die. You know, there's even a little grave over there with a little cross. And there are different options, you know, you can decide to have a mate. If you decide to have a mate, then life is more complicated, there are more obstacles, but you live longer. And instead, if you're by yourself, it's easier, but you die earlier. So it's a very philosophical and quite beautiful game, and I thought it would be perfect for the exhibition. Jason Rohrer is really an interesting game designer, and there are many other games that you might want to explore. Another way to look at life, much more old-fashioned in form, but very contemporary, is this gorgeous book by Christian May, that's my Julie Joliat, that's called Pig 05049. The book follows the afterlife of a pig from a commercial farm in the Netherlands after it's slaughtered. And there are more than 180 products that are made with any part of this pig, ranging from, of course, ham, to also cigarettes, which contain the hemoglobin of the pig, Crayola crayons, I mean, you name it. And it's really interesting to see what happens and how industrialized also the most organic of lives is. You know, it's at the same time a tribute to the economy and also to the craziness of our, of our consumerist society. And you know, it shows how you have every single time to choose the right medium to communicate your thesis or your idea. Probably if Christian had done this in a website, it would have never had the same impact. You hold this book, which is actually bound with butcher's paper. There's a little pig's knout in plastic, very, um, very abstract on the, on the edge of the book. And throughout, it's an amazing read and an amazing visual collection. Life talks to you also through the family. And this is the work of James Auger and Jimmy Loiseau uh, that are also from London. And it's a series of dials that inform the rest of your family of your moods. It's almost like a, a wall mood ring, a, a high-tech mood ring that lets your family know that today they better leave you alone. Or, you know, and it does so by taking your um, thermal picture. Actually, thermal photography has become really advanced and it's used a lot by security details. Even at the airport, for instance, in Narita Airport, when you go through, when you get out, there's a thermal camera that makes sure you don't have a temperature because they're so afraid of flu. And uh, um, also, um, the security TSA is studying its application uh, through, throughout airports. So they take a scan of you, a picture of you, a thermal picture of you, as you go through security. And then when they question you, they, sh they see the changes. It's almost like an fMRI, like a magnetic, a functional magnetic resonance done in a more um, applicable way. And the same thing happens here in this familial nucleus, and people are able to see each other and see each other's mood from a distance. And also it picks up certain patterns, so it informs you also in advance of certain biorhythms. Revi Talco and another graduate of the RCA, I'm starting to get embarrassed, I better not say it anymore, but she's, she's been a graduate for quite a few years and she's a really, really fine designer who is able to mix uh, uh, very old ways of design with very new issues and preoccupations, has designed this uh, whole series of genetic heirlooms, and this in particular is the disclosure case. Uh, of course it's very speculative, but the idea is that your ancestors and your great-grandmother and so on and so forth inform you of your genetic 
inheritance. So they let you know if they've had any diseases or if there's something that you should look out for. So instead of having your DNA just simply analyzed by some outside lab with coldness and without much participation, you have your own family telling you what to expect from your own DNA. Of course, when life talks to us, um, you know, designers are always trying to help us make sense of what life is about. And one of the ways to help us when we cannot make sense anymore is to connect us with gods, gods of any kind. So there are a few uh, religious items in the exhibition, and this is one of my favorite. It's a, uh, an, uh, um, it's an, a, a device for nuns that are in cloister nuns. Yeah, you say cloister when they are behind bars. So these nuns in England really live behind bars. They have rarely any contact with the outside world, maybe a little bit the radio, but not too much, and only their Catholic newspaper, so what do they know? So this particular, this item, has a ticker tape that lets, us, that lets them have topics to pray on, to pray about. So the war in Afghanistan, and they're sometimes mixed, they're taken from the internet. There is a mixture of real uh, news from, say, the BBC or other news sites, and then some other that are taken from We Feel Fine, you know, the Jonathan Harris and Seth Kanbar website. So it's a mixture of very personal individual requests for help and instead serious issues that are going on in the world. And we also have a quite beautiful um, tool for Muslims, which is um, a prayer rug that is embedded with a lot of LEDs that light up when it's really set in the direction of Mecca. So instead of having your own compass, you can actually try different directions with your rug and it lights up when you're in the right direction. We also have other, you know, we decided to be equal opportunities, so we also have uh, tools for Judaism, a few more uh, prayer items, and also the ultimate religion, which is science. So we also have a few Darwinian instruments in order to put yourself in connection with that kind of religion. Now, the city talks with you also a lot, and you talk back. You know, we've been reading, you know, ever since 311 was introduced a few years ago, we've had our share of complaints or uh, approval um, laudations of the site itself, but there are many different ways for us to communicate with it. And designers have been working on it a lot. Mayo Nissen from Denmark invented this system called City Tickets, because of course we have 311, but how frustrating it is, I don't know how many use it, um, how many of you use it. You call and then they give you a number and then you know that they're never going to get there in time to stop the drilling from happening at one in the morning when you really need to sleep. So you don't even have any proof that anything is going to happen. So he said, well, this is one of those instances where, okay, technology is good, but we still need our piece of paper. We want to have a receipt. So he's been uh, readapting all of the parking meters, parking uh, vending machines around Copenhagen to also issue particular receipts that enable you to, to know, I mean, you, you communicate with the city by uh, calling them or by writing to them, and then you get a receipt. So you have actual tangible proof that a communication has happened. But this is one of the most interesting examples of how the city can communicate with us, because you see, the exhibition will have some verbal communication, but not too much, because otherwise it would be this cacophonia of like, voices and music, etc. So I'm trying to have mostly non-verbal communication by using all the other senses, of course, there's sight, of course, there's tact, but nobody really thinks of smell enough, except for Cecil Tolas. Cecil Tolas is a wonderful researcher and smell artist. She's very, she's very um, idiosyncratic. She was here last year, we organized here at Parsons, um, a conference called Headspace, a one-day symposium on scent as a form of design, and she made a presentation here. She works with IFF, which is International Flavors and Fragrances, one of the companies that mixes the scents that we all wear. You know, so they mix perfumes for Estee Lauder, they do it for Serge Boutelles, you name it. They really are at the basis because, as happens also with music, you have a few interpreters or, or publishers, but then it's a pool of people that tend to write and produce the songs. The same happens with perfumes. So she works with them, but she doesn't do nice smells. Actually, she tries to go around and distill the smell of places. Headspace is a technology that enables you to capture the smell of, say, flowers or fruits. It's an ampoule that condenses the vapors that come out of, say, beautiful natural elements. Well, Cecil does it for different parts of the city. And what you see over there, top left, is a map of Berlin 
by distilled scents. So those of you who know Berlin can kind of recognize you know, the east and the west side and the southwest. And they really, they're pretty disgusting scents, but they do represent the city. And do you know how powerful scent can be? I mean, how many of you can recognize Paris by the smell of rotten eggs in the subway? Yeah, or the certain smell that happens in the subway here or Chinatown in the summer. So, so it's really, it's really amazing how powerful smell is to give you a sense of place. So this is what we're going to have of hers in the exhibition. We're going to try to also have swabs that you can actually test. But we've asked her to first let us smell them ourselves to see how it goes. Um, the technology can enable you also to have a very personal relationship with the city and to recreate a sense of neighborhood that was sometimes lost. And this is a work called Baker Tweet by Polk. Polk is in London, in East London actually, and they are not too far from Albion Bakery in Shoreditch. And you know, over there in London is where all the design offices are today. And the Albion Bakery has this instrument called Baker Tweet in, down in the, near the oven, and they send a tweet to everybody who's subscribed to let them know that the croissants are coming out of the oven. So you can immediately know when something good is coming out. So we're talking to we don't know whether we're talking to Essa Bagel, but maybe we'll find we want to find a bakery near uh, near Roma, which is not very easy because in Midtown, hello, there's no bakeries. But we need to find one so that we can actually make that happen and people can be advised at MoMA, the suns are out, run! So it's very nice because it gives you this sense of place. And this is Eric Fisher's Locals and Tourists. They are static maps, but what they do is they condense the, uh, they kind of represent how many pictures have been taken uh, of different parts of different cities. There are like hundreds of these maps uh, by gathering pictures from Flickr and Picasso. And they are divided by red and blue and yellow. The red ones are the tourists, and you can see that they tend to be in tourist locations. The blue ones tend to be locals, both because they are in weird locations and because they repeat themselves over time. So it's not a one-time trip. And the yellows are the undecided. So, but it's really interesting because it gives you almost like a thermal imaging of a city, depending on you know the the um, love of locals and the love of tourists. Buildings can also talk to us. And some, um, some architects and designers have found a way, and engineers have found a way to really have the skin of their buildings communicate. This is a building in Tokyo called the N Building, and it uses a big QR tag that links you to a website that changes with seasons. You know, sometimes they have advertising. When it's Christmas, it has a little Christmas tree. So it's the idea that you can actually have a communication. Of course, it's always mediated by the eternally present smartphone. And one of the best essays in the catalog is by Kevin Slavin um, that kind of puts down the idea of augmented reality as something that has existed for a long time. You know, after all, our aspiration, mine and yours and everybody else's, is to make technology disappear, to be able to use technology without having to be like idiots you know, with like the intelligent eye or the smartphone in front of us. We'll get there eventually, but we still have to go through some device right now. And Kevin was the author, together with his uh, companions at Area Code, of this beautiful game that was called Crossroads. You know, one thing that is interesting in the exhibition is to show how, com how comfortable we are in mixing <coughs> digital and real by means of technology. So this game in 2006 was quite simple. It was almost like a Pac-Man game that was played through a cell phone in the streets of Greenwich Village here. So you were the little Pac-Man that were on the, uh, and you were real people in the streets. So the GPS was locating you. And then there was this mean monster, you know, it's Papa Sandi it was called, the skull that was trying to eat you. And even though the skull was not real at all, here you were running for your life in the streets <laughs> of Manhattan. And you can see how that can be true. You can see how easy it is to to know that there's no difference between Papa Sandi in the virtual world and in reality. So I really like this connection that we make so automatically. Worlds are our next step in this increasing scale of connection. And worlds in the, in the worlds department, there are a lot of ways to see things differently. This is Chris Wilkins and Kenichi Okada's animal superpowers. It's for children to feel how it is to be an animal. For instance, those big gloves and helmets make you feel like an ant. In the gloves, you have a camera that magnifies 
whatever you're looking and touching 25 times. So mm -hmm. you have a feeling of really being small and on the ground. And instead, the yellow thing has a system of lenses that make you feel like you're a giraffe. So they bring you up almost at the, uh, at the stature of an adult. So it's this change of perception that is so powerful and that lets you see things in a completely different way. This site called BBC Dimensions, if you have never seen it, you should see it because it's so interesting. It lets you take big events in history from the moon landing of the Apollo to the spill in the Gulf, the oil spill in the Gulf, and it lets you bring them home. So you can, say you live in London, you can, you can punch in your zip code, and then you can take the whole oil spill and superimpose it to your home. So the war on terror, the oil spill, and also you can draft the Apollo 11 moon landing as a walk in your neighborhood. So it's a wonderful way to actually give you a real sense of what's happened and a real sense of the magnitude of events. Walk the solar system is also lovely. Same thing, how to uh, bring your neighborhood to a cosmic scale. So this designer, Louise O'Connor, took her neighborhood, also London, and she um, she redrew the solar system at scale, and there was a sun, and then all the different planets, and she walked and met different shopkeepers at the right distance from the, from the sun, and made them guardians of that particular planet. So you could take that map and go into these different stores and ask the shopkeepers, tell me about Venus, and the shopkeeper would tell you about Venus. So it was this wonderful pretext to once again get to know your neighborhood but at the same time have a sense of the scope of the galax galaxy. Josh Ahn's Day Rule is a great website that has not been updated for a long time, but it's very important to me because it was one of the first overtly political users of the internet. It was uh, made in 2004 and then never updated, as I mentioned. <coughs> but it was a website that showed you all the links between different corporate boards in the United States and different government bodies. So it shows you collusion, it showed you conflicts of interest, it showed you possible problems in the future. And it was such a denounce, such, a, um, such an accusation, and such an overt, but at the same time scientific and impartial. I mean, nothing is ever impartial, you know, it's like reporting. Depending on what you choose to show and how, you immediately have a particular gist and a particular point of view. But it was really quite impressive. And it showed how system design and the, um, also the an analysis of system by means of design is a powerful political tool. Avatar machine. Avatar machine is a really <laughs> funny device. You wear this thing, you know, that is like, makes you look like a superhero, but you also have a camera inside that puts you in a video game. So you see yourself as a third person and you're moving in this world and really you start behaving and moving like a second life at the beginning avatar. In second life, you know, that it's always been very clunky and you see the polygonal design also of the avatars, you know, the impossibility of rendering hair in second life has really haunted designers for a long time. And you say, this is the way to render that polygonality. And one of the best features of this particular um, project are the videos of this person walking around, seeing himself from inside as an avatar, and then people looking at him. <laughs> it's quite interesting. But once again, this connection between virtual life and real life that is so easy to break. And it's easy to break also when it comes to games. These are several games that were organized in Edinburgh on the occasion of a festival that happens every year. This is called Hungry Hungry Eat Ed. And you can see it's very simply uh, QR tags that put you, place a really funny head on top of you and make you be seen on a gigantic screen. So far, so much of the uses of technology are still whimsical and uh, promise applications in the future, but are not there yet. And this is one of the most poetic, low-tech uses of technology. It's a gigantic QR tag that is mown into a lawn and that says, hello world. You know, hello world is usually the first phrase or the first, yeah, it's a phrase that programmers uh, try to mimic when they code something new, when they invent a new code language. So hello world has become really um, engraved in the imagination, techies' imagination, and every geek 
uh, really uh, adores this particular phrase because it's been attempted in all sorts of programming codes and with bacteria, you name it. And in this case, mown into a lawn, it's visible from Google Earth and actually it renders the website that says a little world. The last chapter in this particular, in this exhibition is called Double Untangled. Every time you try to categorize reality, you always end up with some miscellaneous. So you always have to have a strange chapter at the end that lets you get away with all the things that didn't fit before. But the misfits, I found out, were amongst the most interesting examples of communication between people and objects and amongst people. Sputniko, with the exclamation mark, oh, and it's misspelled there, Sputniko, Sputniko, I'm sorry, is a really interesting <coughs> Japanese artist that likes to always make very composite uh, works that are usually a visual part, that is like a painting or an acrylic painting, then an actual device, and then movies, usually also <coughs> music videos. Crowbot Jenny is her invention of this particular figure that doesn't really like to talk to people, and she likes instead to talk to crows. So she invents this device that lets her send crows four or five different signals and enables her to really talk to them. So she goes around with her device and uh, I know we'll, we'll show the video and it's going to be really fantastic. What I don't have here, because I'm a chicken and I have to change this PowerPoint, but is her best work, which I really love. It's a menstruation machine. Actually, let me go to the internet and show it to you because it's so wonderful. It really is it's very beautiful. It's a way to enable a transsexual man to feel what it means to have, to really be a woman and also have your period. So it's this kind of chastity belt that compresses you and gives you cramps. Then you're supposed to draw blood and put it in this reservoir so you also have to wear a pad and go through the whole nine yards to feel what it means to be a woman. And of course, she also made a song with a music video that actually reached pretty high in Japan.
more bats, more animals. I really like the work of Natalie Jeremijenko, and I wanted to celebrate it. And here we're celebrating this bat billboard that is a project to enable bats in New York City to let the whole community and the whole city know how they're doing. So it's really funny because it's the whole, uh, the bat itself, the billboard itself is also a residence, a residence for the bats, but it sends all kinds of messages and then they, uh, Chris and Natalie also hypothesized this way of communicating that bats have, so they kind of decoded fictionally their language and they show that you can hear bats saying to each other, mm, she has great ears, doesn't she? You know, it's, it's quite funny and, 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 and very whimsical. This is instead a very straightforward toy. It's a series of toys that transform, they're transformers. So they go from a kanji character to the animal that corresponds to that particular kanji character. And of course, there's once again all the various disabilities that uh, enable us to study new ways to communicate also amongst ourselves. This is great, which is a Rubik's Cube for the blind. And also the idea that you could just forego completely an alphabetism by having a device that of course does not exist. Read the, the text on books and transmit it vocally into your ear. The last object that I'm going to show to you today is really a link between today and the past. There is an, there is an attitude in the design <coughs> of post-digital, you might have heard about it, it kind of disturbs me a little bit, but it's also interesting. There are many people, usually some of the most technologically advanced uh, researchers or designers, that have decided to go back in time and say, uh, print tweets on newspapers and then distribute them around their neighborhood, or print the whole uh, series of uh, blog posts on the Iraq war in 10 volumes. In this particular case, this book shows all the hyperlinks as real hyperlinks in red thread. So you have a visualization, a physical representation of the hyperlinks in a particular text. Now, as you can tell, the exhibition itself is not given to you or to the public in a real fixed format. There's a lot of imprecision, a lot of blurred boundaries, and a lot of room for improvement and for completion. And that's what, something that I have learned that is very important. And I've learned it from design and the elastic mind, but it's also part of the way we live today. I and mean, if you think about it, a blog is never ended, and is never ending, and a work is never done. You know, we could go on perfecting our text when we printed our texts once, they were printed and that was it. Today we can keep on adding. We always have to leave everything we do open-ended. And so happens also with an exhibition. An exhibition is always formed by at least three different <coughs> spaces. One is the space of the galleries themselves, and of course it's a physical space that uh, responds to different rules and regulations. There are, of course, the real rules and regulation of security and how many people can fit into it, and then there are the rules of understandability in a physical realm. <coughs> then you have the catalog, and of course the catalog is sequential, and even if you augment it with QR tags and you let people go beyond, the pages themselves, it still has a certain sequence that you have to follow. And then lastly, there's the website where you usually can have more freedom to spread yourselves and spread your wings in different directions, but at the same time, you don't have the support of the physicality <coughs> of the objects themselves. And an exhibition would never be complete without, without these three spaces coming together and without some doubts and some vulnerabilities left so that also the public can talk back and give feedback. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you will give me also feedback, and I'm happy to get questions from you if you have time. Thank you. That was just awesome. Really? Thank you.